Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop, created for people with diabetes by people who have diabetes. By Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, how are you eating these days? Some kitchen and cooking advice to help us through. Chef Mark Allison knows his way around a kitchen with a family. He has three boys, one of whom was diagnosed with type 1 as a baby. As a professional chef and teacher, he says, just get started. Getting in that kitchen and making something over the next 30 or 40 minutes and then sitting down, eating the food, but actually having a conversation. Instead of everybody upstairs playing Xbox or uh, some (laughs) kind of games, you're actually in one room communicating and you're making something that hopefully everybody's going to enjoy. You'll hear Mark's unique story. He and his wife moved to Alaska for an international program back in 1999 and their 14-month-old son was diagnosed shortly after that. In Tell Me Something Good, a little bit of help for someone who's been giving a lot of it, talk about paying it forward and back, and a lot of mac and cheese. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of Diabetes Connections. We aim to educate and inspire by sharing stories of connection. And in this time, it is so important to stay connected. On this week's show, we are not going to be talking specifically about the coronavirus. Rather, this is a show that will maybe inspire you or help you to get in the kitchen at this time when we are all forced in our house. And I I don't know about you, but I've been cooking more than ever. But maybe to look at things a little bit differently get your kids involved, try something new. I was so excited to talk to Mark Allison. We've known each other for a long time and I've been trying to get him on the show. And it's just one of those, you know, the beauty is in the timing sometimes because maybe this episode will kind of give you a fun day and some fun ideas to try at a time when, boy, we do need a little bit of fun and a little bit of inspiration. So there will be more information about Mark's cookbook, Let's Be Smart About Diabetes, a little bit later on. And I would urge you, if you're not already in the Facebook group, to please join that. It is Diabetes Connections, the group, because I'm going to be putting some of the recipes and notes that he gave me into the Facebook group. I cannot put them in the show notes. It's just a format thing. So I apologize for that. They, they will not be on the episode homepage, but they will be in posts in the Facebook group. So head on over there to that. And just another quick note before we get started. Thank you to everybody who continues to buy my book, The World's Worst Diabetes Mom. Um, If you need a laugh in these times, maybe it's there for you. I've heard from people who are really enjoying it right now, who have the audiobook too, who maybe didn't have time to listen before. Although I mostly listen to audiobooks in my car, so my audiobook and podcast consumption, frankly, is way down right now because I'm at home. I'm not commuting. I'm not driving anywhere. But I do listen when I clean and do laundry and stuff like that. So maybe that's it. But thanks again. The World's Worst Diabetes Mom is available at Amazon. It is in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook. You could also buy it over at diabetes-connections.com, but frankly, Amazon's probably the easiest right now. And I was so happy to be involved in the Children with Diabetes virtual conference that happened recently. I bet you can still find that online. I was able to tape my World's Worst Diabetes Mom presentation for them. Of course, as you know, like many of you, I was planning to go to lots of diabetes conferences in the last month and this spring, and it's all on hold right now. So a little bit of online goodness for you. I will also link up the Children with Diabetes Conference, which had tons of presentations in it. I think it's going to be a real resource going forward for a lot of people. So I'm thrilled that they did that. All right, Mark Allison coming up in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Real Good Foods. We got a sample of the Real Good Foods ice cream. They sent it to us. Uh, Benny and I did a Facebook Live, uh, I think it's almost three weeks ago now. Wow. About what we thought, our reactions. And I got to tell you, I have been enjoying the real good ice cream since then. It is so delicious. It is a lower sugar ice cream that tastes like ice cream. You have probably had ice creams that are lower carb that taste kind of chunky and chalky. And there is none of that. I sat down. I shouldn't say this. I ate almost the entire pint of the mint chocolate chip. I stopped myself, but <laughs> it was going there. 
<laughs> so check them out. You can find out more at realgoodfoods.com. They ship. Yes, they're in the grocery store freezer. But right now, I, I know a lot of you, and, and us included, you're looking at um, home delivery and you can find all of their stuff online. They'll deliver it for you. Some great shipping deals as well. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Real Good Foods logo. My guest this week is a terrific chef who, as you'll hear, teaches healthy cooking, but isn't above eating s'mores with his three sons. Mark Allison works with the Cabarrus County Health Alliance, a local county to me here in North Carolina, teaching needed home cooking skills. He has been the director of culinary nutrition for the Dole Nutrition Institute, and he spent many years teaching classical chefs as the dean of culinary arts education at Johnson & Wales University here in Charlotte. Yes, Johnson & Wales does have a campus here in Charlotte. One of Mark's sons was diagnosed with type 1 as a baby, and his wife was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer in 2008. Now, she did pass away, but as you'll hear, his wife was able to live longer than anybody expected her to, which he says really made him a believer in the power of a plant-based diet to fight disease and prolong life. Mark has a new book out called Let's Be Smart About Diabetes, a cookbook to help control blood sugar while getting the family back around the kitchen table. We are putting recipes in the Facebook group, as I said, and of course, links in the show notes. Here's my talk with Chef Mark Allison. Mark, thank you so much for making some time for me. I know you've got all your boys home, and while we're not, I guess we're not doing much these days, it still seems like the time is filling up, but thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Stacey, you're very welcome, and it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much. I'm excited to talk to you. We've known each other for a long time. I was thinking, I think we met possibly the Johnson & Wales cooking competition of some kind where I was an extremely unqualified judge. Do you remember (laughs) that at all? (laughs) Uh, The good old days, Stacey. The good old days. Yes, I remember uh, meeting you there, uh, and and you were... uh, Totally qualified for the position to be a judge. And yes, you did I, exceptionally well. Because I enjoy eating. So there you go. <laughs> Me too. Me too. You know, my being a chef has fitted very nicely into my lifestyle because I love to eat. Love it. Well, you know, I want to pick your brain as long as we have you to talk about how to try to eat well as long as, you know, we're all stuck at home. But let's talk about, let's talk about diabetes first. Let's get your story. Yeah. Because I know everyone already hearing you knows that you are, you're native to North Carolina. That's a beautiful Southern accent that you have. But Actually, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> People get that mixed up all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually from a little town called uh, Newcastle upon Tyne, which is in the Northeast of England. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up there and the place where uh, they usually say coals from Newcastle. Uh, or Newcastle Brown Ale or Newcastle Soccer Club are the, oh. the three things that people really know Newcastle for. But that's where I was born. Uh, I moved to South Wales and lived in South Wales for 10 years. Travelled all over Europe and uh, in 2004 landed in Charleston, South Carolina. Lived there for a year, then moved up to Charlotte. And I've been in Charlotte now 15 years and absolutely love living in Charlotte. Oh, that's great. All right. So, but your your diabetes story, your your son's really, starts in Alaska. Can you tell us that? I was one of 30 people picked by the Fulbright Teachers Exchange Program, which uh, is a program that started after World War II to get the world together through education. And uh, teachers apply and they are asked to go to different countries around the world. And I was asked to go to America. And I thought, yes, this is going to be fabulous. Being brought up in the 70s and the 80s on Starsky and Hutch and streets of <laughs> San Francisco, I naturally thought I was going to California. Uh, but out of 500 teachers that applied to come to Europe, there was only one chef, and he did not live in California. He actually lived in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, we actually turned down the position at first because my wife said, we are not taking a two-year-old and an eight months to Alaska. Wow. So we turned it down, and then uh, Glenn... Uh, the teacher rang me up at home and said, look, can you do me a favor? This is the fourth year I have applied. And my daughter has won a four-year scholarship at Oxford University, and this is her last year. Can you please take the position so we can be in with her for the last year that is in the UK? So we decided to move over there, and we actually had an absolute fabulous year. But while we were living there, Matthew, my youngest son at the time, who was uh, eight months when we arrived, when he got up to the age of 14 months, he became ill. And we took him to the doctors, and the doctor said he just had a bad case of the flu. He'd be okay. 
And about a week later, he had lost a tremendous amount of weight. He was drinking a load of fluids. And I just happened to be talking to my brother on the phone that weekend, who was a type 1 diabetic and has been since the age of 15 years old. And he said, I think he might be a type 1, take him back to the doctors. So we took Matthew back and we had a young doctor. She was a lovely lady, but she said, there's no way he's a type 1 diabetic. It, normally, it's going to be about seven or eight years old. He's only 14 months. And uh, she just said, no, I'm not testing his blood. <gasps> so, oh of course, my, my wife, who was uh, like any mother, uh, said, well, we're not leaving your office until you actually test his blood. <laughs> so there was a bit of a standoff for about 30 minutes. And uh, then she tested his blood. And within 30 minutes, uh, Matthew was in intensive care and he was there for the next seven days. Uh, his blood sugars were so far through the roof that we were told that we had have left her office and went home. We more than likely would have been in a coma that night. So we were exceptionally lucky. Uh, the doctor from that stage could not do enough for us. Uh, she was at his <laughs> bedside every day. And uh, as you know, uh, life changes. Uh, so we decided to look at food as sort of medicine and changed all our eating habits for Matthew. So from the age of 14 months, Matthew has been on a really healthy diet. He now just turned 22 in December and uh, he's in great shape. He's at college at the minute and um, he's doing exceptionally well. But that's where it all started back in you know, 1999. And I think it's worth repeating for people who are who have children who are newer diagnosed or, or maybe have been newer diagnosed themselves. There really was this thinking because the same thing happened to us. Benny wasn't yet two years old and they said, Nah, under the age of two, it's, it's yep. not going to be type one. There was this thinking, and I, I don't know if it's just that they're getting better at it or there are more cases in infants and babies, but it, it has changed a lot thanks to people like you who push and educate it. Oh, my goodness. You know, it is frightening uh, because you go to your doctor and you just think they've got all the answers. Right. And uh, But something like type one diabetes is, you know, now it's becoming more and more, uh, people have become more and more aware. I remember when my brother uh, was diagnosed. They, he was in hospital for six months because they were unsure of actually what it was. Oh my gosh. And uh, the unfortunate thing for my brother, he was 15 at the time, so he was nearly an adult in England, and he was actually on a cancer ward for six months. And uh, what was frightening with him was he was watching people that were dying around him. Oh and uh, unfortunately, that marked him for life. He is now nearly 60, and he's uh, in good shape, and he's healthy. Uh, but he still remembers them times where people were actually dying around him because they thought he didn't have diabetes. They thought he had cancer at the time. But times have changed, and I think it's a lot more easy to diagnose now. And we've got great doctors. People like uh, Mark Vanderwell is just amazing. Yeah. I think now we can rely on the, the medical professionals to diagnose a lot quicker than what it was, say, 20 years ago. Yeah, and and your your son and your brother must have had some interesting conversations about not only the difference of diagnosis but the difference of treatment. I mean, I'm I'm so happy oh, your brother is doing well because I can't imagine. Well, my my I can remember my mother having to ster sterilize his syringe and needles every night oh. because uh, the, there were the days where there were like the one inch long needles and you could reuse them and the syringe was reused. And he was getting injected twice a day. Now he's on the pen, uh, so he, he works a lot better for him. But I can remember those days having to prick his finger and testing his blood and then cleaning the syringe and then counting his carbs. It was a difficult time for my mother. I know that. Yeah, I feel, you know, you never want to say we're lucky with diabetes because it still stinks. Yeah. But oh, those oh, stories yeah. do make me grateful for insulin pumps and pens. My goodness. Oh, it's, yeah. Matt, that, Matthew's just changed over to a new pump. Uh, the Omnipod, and, uh, you know, he's been on the pump uh, for at least the last 12 years, and what a difference that has made, you know. We as parents, I'm sure you're the same, feel a lot easier that he's on something that basically regulates everything, and as long as he tests his blood, he knows when he's either going to go low or go high, and these uh, instruments these days are just amazing. Yeah, it really is. I'm, I feel really grateful. Right, yeah. let's, let's jump in and let's talk about food. Because yep. not only are you a renowned chef and a you know an educator of other chefs, 
But now you work to educate the public, which I just think is absolutely amazing because we need all the help we can get, Mark, as you well know. So, first off, let me let you explain what it is that you do. You work for the Cabarrus County Health Alliance, which is a nearby you know, county to mine here in, in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. What do you do right now in terms of teaching the public? Right back to Mark answering that question. But first, getting diabetes supplies is a pain. Not only the ordering and the picking up, but also the arguing with insurance over what they say you need and what you really need. Make it easy with OneDrop. They offer personalized test strip plans. Plus, you get a Bluetooth glucose meter, test strips, lancets, and your very own certified diabetes coach. Subscribe today to get test strips for less than $20 a month delivered right to your door. No prescriptions or copays required. One less thing to worry about. Not that surprising when you learn that the founder of OneDrop lives with type 1. They get it. OneDrop. Gorgeous gear, supplies delivered to your door, 24-7 access to your certified diabetes coach. Learn more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneDrop logo. Now back to Mark, and he is answering my question about teaching people the very basics. Uh, I have a wonderful job, and it's funny how I started as a chef at 16, and I trained to, uh, with French cuisine, and lots of fat, sugar, and salt, and nobody counted calories or anything, and now I've went full circle to being a healthy chef, and I try to teach people how to improve their diets. So I work for the Cabarrus Health Alliance, which is based in Kannapolis, and my job is a fascinating job uh, in the fact that I go out to the general public, I go to schools and hospitals and churches. And I also do cooking classes at the Cabarrus Health Alliance. And I try to teach people how to cook, because if you think about it, Stacey, cooking is a life skill, but nobody knows how to cook these days. Uh, What I noticed just last week when uh, the food stores were out of canned goods and frozen goods, actually the produce section was still full. And my advice to anybody, especially at this time with the coronavirus is eat healthy by eating as many fruits and vegetables as you possibly can because they're just packed full of vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. So my job at the Cabarrus Health Alliance is basically try to teach people how to cook and to uh, choose better food choices and not so much uh, processed food, not so much food that is packed with fat, sugar, or salt and try to get a healthy balance. You know, it doesn't all have to be healthy, but if you do choose healthy options, you'll feel better your health will improve and it'll fight off viruses. So when we're all stuck at home and we have this mentality, which is this is very unique, obviously. Yeah. I mean, unprecedented. But now that we're stuck at home, what would your advice be? Because I did the same thing. I'll be honest with you. When I went to the grocery store a couple of days ago, I picked up, you know, some apples, some oranges, but I wasn't I was thinking hunker down. So I bypassed a lot of the fresh fruits and vegetables. Now that it seems, and again, we're as we're recording this, it seems like the grocery stores are going to be fine. There's no problem with the food supply. What what would you suggest we do next time we go to the store? I would uh, look at the uh, fresh produce and, you know, start by picking the fruits and vegetables that you like to eat. And then why not try something different, something that you've seen before, but thought, you know what? I wonder what that tastes like. Give it a try. You'll be amazed. I normally teach this in class where we'll have like a surprise ingredient. And uh, part of the class is everybody's got to try everything I make. And uh, I might have a fresh fruit or vegetable and I chop it up and I pass it around. And it's amazing that nine times out of 10, everybody likes it. We've got these uh, preconceived notions that we'll look at something and think, oh, I don't think I like that. But actually, when you put it in your mouth and you try it, more than likely, you're going to try something new and it's, it's going to be interesting and you're going to enjoy the taste. So I, w- I would go around the uh, fresh produce section and try something new, try something different. And I've found the best way, for, especially with having three boys, if I want to try something for new with them, I normally just make a smoothie or a soup because you can easily add something new and disguise it. And they don't even know that they're eating it. <laughs> and then when you've told them that they've eaten something new, they say, you know what, that wasn't too bad. Let's try it again. So I think it's all about experiment. And we've got the ideal time, like you just said, Stacey, we're all cooped up at home. Why not get in the kitchen with the boys or girls or family members and make something delicious to eat tonight? I, I've got to be honest. People tell me when they ask what I do for a living, I say, well, I've never worked a day in my life because mm-hmm. I love what I do, which is I love food and I love to cook. 
But I've found it's the best way to make new friends. It's the best way to keep the family together. Getting in that kitchen and making something over the next 30 or 40 minutes and then sitting down, eating the food, but actually having a conversation. Instead of everybody upstairs playing Xbox or uh, some <laughs> kind of games, you're actually in one room communicating and you're making something that hopefully everybody's going to enjoy. All right. A lot of people listening are going to say, well, sure, that sounds great, but I, I never learned to cook. I'm afraid to cook. It, my stuff always comes out terrible. How do you start adults who really did not learn the skill? You know what? I was very lucky because when all my friends chose to do woodwork and metalwork, <laughs> I was doing home economics. And uh, as you can imagine, back in the 70s and 80s, that didn't go down too well with a yeah. lot of the guys. <laughs> but you know what my thinking was, Stacey? One, instead of being locked up in a room with 19 sweaty guys, I was in an air-conditioned room with 19 girls. <laughs> and uh, it, it worked out pretty good because I found out very quickly two things. Everybody likes people who can cook, and it's the best way to make friends. So I understand that a lot of people don't know how to cook. But actually, you can go online now and on YouTube, yeah. and you can learn practically any technique that you need. And I'll tell people, all you really need to start with is a chopping board and a knife. And then find a recipe that you've always wanted to try. And you can easily download any recipe now from online or watch a YouTube video. And cooking is one of the simplest things you can ever learn. It, it's all about temperature control. It's either going to be hot or cold. And if you can control the temperature, you can make and eat anything you like. Wow. Do you remember, I'll put you on the spot here, do you remember what you first taught your boys to make when they were little? I, I picture them standing on stools in the kitchen, you know, learning from dad. Uh, probably, and this isn't exactly healthy. Uh, <laughs> and actually, we did this last night. We were sitting in the backyard having a fire pit and we all had s'mores. So I'm guessing probably s'mores <laughs> were probably one of the very first recipes I taught my boys. But I also taught them something very important. It's all about moderation. Whatever you make, have it in moderation. Uh, but my three boys all know how to cook, obviously, because they've been brought up by a chef. I tell people when I'm at work, I'll text my boys, empty the dishwasher, prepare the vegetables, set the kitchen table. And then when I get home, all that's done. And then we get in the kitchen together and we cook dinner that night. But if I forget to text one day, believe it or not, Stacey, I get home and nothing has been done because boys are boys. Oh, yeah. I've been there with both of my kids, boys and girls. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, but you didn't send the text. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But, I'm, you know, it's good to know you're human. I think it's always more fun to know with the s'mores, right, that, you know, you yeah. can have fun food and it's fun to learn. And then you can use those skills. I don't know what quite what skills are involved in s'mores <laughs> making, but you have to control the temperature. Don't right? burn you your fingers. To, that was, that was burn... the main skill, I think. <laughs> That's an important one in the kitchen. Hey, but tell people, us about so, uh, People ask me all the time, how do you make a healthy dessert, Mark? And I'll say there's oh. no such thing as a healthy dessert. So just enjoy whatever you're going to eat, but have a smaller portion. You're not it's a big fan about, of sugar-free okay. and substitutes and things like that? I don't use any sugar-free ingredients. If I'm going to make something and it adds sugar in, I'll add the sugar. Because normally, even if you're making a cake and it asks for uh, half a cup of sugar, when you consider that cake is going to divide, be divided into eight or ten portions, that half cup of sugar it comes down to practically nothing. Uh, so I'd rather use the ingredients that are meant to be in a certain food item than start trying to guess, well, if I put sugar-free uh, uh, item in, it's going to work out the same. Because I'd rather just enjoy it the way it's meant to be than try to mess on with it. It's the same with all these gluten-free products and low in sugar products. You know, you're taking out one thing, but you're adding something else processed. And to me, you're far better off eating ingredients that you know are ingredients that are more healthy than something that is a preservative or an additive or a colorant. Love it. So tell us about your cookbook that you have out right now. I brought out Let's Be Smart About Diabetes. Uh, a few months ago, and uh, that actually started in 2008, but that was the same year my wife was diagnosed with stage four cancer. So the book was shelved, and then when my wife passed away in 2015, I was approached by the American Diabetic Association to publish the book, and uh, so they they bought the rights to the book, but then they held on to it for two years, and then unfortunately they laid off most of their editorial staff and said they were only going to publish well-known authors. 
which I was wow. not one of them. So they give me the full rights back. And uh, so I just published that about six months ago. And it's all family recipes that we've used over the last 20 years with Matthew. All the recipes, believe me, Stacey, are very easy to use. You know, most of them take between 10 and 20 minutes. Uh, they're all health-based. There's nothing outrageous. I'm not asking anybody to buy superfoods. I don't believe in superfoods. I believe in if you eat an apple, that's probably the best food you can eat, or a banana, or if you have broccoli or cabbage. They don't have to be superfoods. They're just packed anyway with uh, healthy vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals. So it's all based on uh, practicality and what you can actually buy in your local store. Uh, so this, it's packed full of soups and breakfast ideas, snacks, lunches, um, meals for the kids, and sort of healthy desserts. I, I'd love to ask you, and I, I, we didn't discuss this in advance, but it, would it be possible to grab a recipe or two from the book that you think might help people who are you know, stuck at home right now, maybe beginner oh. level or something that would keep, and we could post that for the podcast audience? Yeah. Uh, please do. Just choose whatever recipe you think is suitable. There's over 150 recipes in the book to choose from. And like I said, they're very easy to put together. And this could be the ideal time to grab a cookbook and, and try some of the recipes. No doubt. All right. How do you stand on, we've talked about, you know, going to the produce section, trying to buy fresh whenever possible. Where do you stand on canned and frozen ingredients? Yeah, I'm a firm believer in fresh. But if, you, if you've got no option, then frozen would be my next choice. And then canned. But if you're going to buy canned fruits or vegetables, make sure that they haven't got any added sugar. Yeah. You know what I saw in the supermarket recently? Forget added sugar. They were packed in um, uh, Splenda. They had a sugar substitute in the, the, quote, fruit juice. Yeah. Uh, Well, you know what? People have got to make their own minds up on if they're going to use artificial sweeteners or not. I personally don't. So, you know, it's, it's a choice you've got to make. But to tell the truth, if I've got the opportunity, I always buy fresh because fresh normally is in season. So if you can buy seasonal fruits and vegetables, then they've got the, the best nutrient dense properties within them. They haven't been touched. Make sure that you wash your fruits and vegetables when you get them home and either eat them raw or add them to some kind of soup or lunch or dinner item. And to me, that's the best way to keep yourself healthy. I'm a firm believer in, and my boys follow this practice as well. If you have half your plate, fruits and vegetables, then you're not going to go too far wrong from being healthy in your ideal weight. That's great advice. Yeah, back to the, the canned fruit, though. I got to be honest with you, and yeah. you don't have to. You don't have to take a stand. But I was appalled to see canned fruit with Splenda added because the big packaging was like, you know, low in sugar. And I thought, oh, good, that just means that they're packed it in water or something. And I turned it over to look at the label. I was like, Splenda, how much processing do you have to go through to, to add that? And I was like, oh, so I put that back. But in these, yeah. you know, I know people are worried right now, and many people may have purchased more canned and frozen goods than yep. they normally do, looking at me. So we're all looking to try to do the best we can. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's baby yeah. steps. It's baby steps. You know, you can you can just turn your diet upside down because it's not going to work. And I tell most people, start with breakfast and just eat something healthier at breakfast. And that's the ideal time to have a smoothie, you know, and you can pack it full of uh, vegetables, you know, cut back on the, uh, the fruit so much, but add uh, spinach or kale to your smoothie, add blueberries. But look at your, your breakfast first and just change your breakfast for about a month. And then work on your lunch and then finally work on your dinner. But, you know, if you, if you just start slow, then your body becomes adjusted to it and you'll feel a lot more healthier. What's your favorite smoothie? Actually, when I used to be the director of culinary nutrition for the Dole Food Company, I came up with a smoothie that obviously included bananas. <laughs> 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 but it had almond milk, bananas and coffee. And uh, that was a coffee fix up. And the number of people that complimented that smoothie was unbelievable. But my favorite smoothie has is, is always got blueberries in because blueberries are one of the best fruits you can eat for your memory as you get older. And I pack that with blueberries and spinach. I usually have a banana in. I use almond milk and a handful of almonds. And mm. uh, that, that sees me all the way through to lunch. I like um, spinach, mango and almond milk. Oh, that's really good. Mango is my favorite fruit. Ah, so and I, any, I'll tell anything. you what, I, I use the frozen mango because it you know, yep. makes it cold and, and gives that, that, that exactly. smoothie feel. But I was a big, I, I, I was very reluctant to put anything green in a smoothie. I thought it would taste <laughs> disgusting. I really did. I really did. I, this is going to be yeah. gross. And, and finally, my husband convinced me and it, it's delicious. So uh, I, was, I was shocked, shocked. 
Yeah. But if you can get a and vegetable you know, in you know breakfast. That, and says, you know that uh, spinach has got more protein than the average piece of meat, weight for weight. So if you put, say, four ounces of spinach in your uh, smoothie, then that's got actually more protein than four oh. ounces of beef. So Popeye yeah, had it right. Yeah. You know, eat your spinach. <laughs> and spinach is one of the uh, the best foods in the world you can eat, that as well as kale. Yeah, I'm still not, I'm not around to kale, but maybe I'll try it. I'll, if I could be convinced kale. to eat spinach, I can try kale. <laughs> kale you can get away with in smoothie. And salad, you either like it or you don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, that's a great idea. Um, and then I know you said start with breakfast, move on to lunch, yeah. and then ultimately do your dinners. But I, I have to ask, for, for people who are listening who have younger kids, easy suggestions for dinners that the kids can help with? Is there anything that comes to mind that you did with your boys? Uh, you know, you can always make your own chicken nuggets. They're easy to make. In fact, there's a, there's a recipe in the book for that. But start with things that they actually like. And then yeah. just alter some of the ingredients to more healthy ingredients. Because most of the things you can buy in fast food uh, outlets or in most restaurants, you can replicate at home and make them a lot more healthier. It's, it's just like anything. If you want to learn something, you'll take the time to learn it. And to me, the good thing about cooking is it's a sh- social event. It actually gets people together. And it's a great way. When my wife passed away five years ago, that was one of the, the things I insisted with my boys that every night we went into the kitchen. Now, five years on, we do exactly the same thing. Mm. They, wait, they can't wait to get in the kitchen and see what we're going to eat that night. And usually they choose one of the evening meals during the week. And then we're all mucking together. We're all rolled with sleeves up. We're all cooked together. And then again, like I said, we actually sit down at the kitchen table and spend the next 30 to 90 minutes just having a conversation, which is fabulous. It's, it's the highlight of my day. Wow. I'll tell you what, it really is an amazing thing when you can get everybody away from their electronics sitting at the table. You know, we set, we did that too. We set the table every night. Yeah. Even if we're bringing in, we do bring in occasionally, you know, it goes on the table, it comes out of the takeout. Yeah. <laughs> but food it's still that social experience. Yeah. Food, is, yeah. food is one of the one things that will bring people together. And even if it doesn't turn out great, you can all have a laugh about it. <laughs> and just try it again the next day. You know, yes, we, it's, it, nobody's going to have a fight over a burnt pancake. You know, they, they, <laughs> you're just going to laugh about it and say, you know what, I'm going to try better tomorrow. You know, I'm glad to hear you say that because I've been there many times. <laughs> Bef- before I let you go, you know, your, yeah. your life has been so interesting to be touched by type 1 diabetes in your family. And then, yeah. of course, you've had that unbelievable experience with cancer and, and losing your wife. And I'm, I'm yeah. so sorry, Mark. But now working with people who are honestly, depending on you to teach them better ways to manage health, whether it is diabetes or trying to avoid complications from other illnesses. Exactly. I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you do meet with these people having, as you said, you started with, you know, French cuisine, fancy restaurants, yep. fancy chefs. Now you're meeting with people who may not even understand how to fry an egg. You know, what, what has that been like? Interesting. Uh, but before, before, before I took this job, I was a, a culinary instructor uh, for 20 years. So I could, um, I've dealt with a lot of people and different learning needs. Uh, and it, it, it all always comes back to the basics. If you can pick up the basics of anything, then you'll be successful. So when you consider I'm now working for the health department, and I didn't realize these facts until I actually started working for the health department. But 85% of all chronic diseases, such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obviously not type 1, and cancer, are food-related. Yeah. And uh, we're living in an uh, epidemic at the minute with the rise of type 2 diabetes and the continuing rise of heart disease and cancer. And if people just realized that food is so important to preventing heart disease and cancer and type 2 diabetes, but also it's so important once you've got one of these diseases to actually improve your immune system by eating healthy food. And the healthiest foods on the planet are fruits and vegetables, nuts, beets, beans, seeds, and lean proteins and lean dairies. You've got to look at your food supply. Try not to eat so much processed food because that's where all the additives are. That's where they've put in the colorants, the preservatives. You know, you can't buy a loaf of bread that goes moldy in a day now. You know, that loaf of bread will stand there without gathering mold for a week to two weeks. Now, that isn't good, you know. Actually, I just yeah. made fresh bread last night. I couldn't get any bread at the store yesterday, so I decided to get the flour out and I had some dry yeast. And making bread is so easy, it took less than five minutes. But just look 
at the food that you generally eat and just try. You know, when you consider the rise in costs of health insurance, every year it goes up. And, and you will know because I know with Matthew's insulin and uh, mm. equipment for his pump, it just gets more and more expensive every year. But if you're healthy, then look at that as being a lifesaver for you as, as, as far as money is concerned. Because if you can stay healthy and off prescription medication, you're going to literally save thousands of dollars every year. And your life is going to live longer and you're going to enjoy life more. So I think a lot of it's all about prevention. But if you do have an illness, then really look at your diet because the food, it's, food is not medicine, but it can help in a way that will make you feel good about yourself. It will make you lose weight and it'll keep you alive a lot longer if you pick the right food choices. And the right food choices are eat more fruits and vegetables. Well, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. It's just always wonderful to talk with you. I'm glad your boys are doing well. Everybody's home now? Everybody's home. Yeah, everybody's home. James got let out of school for the next two weeks, possibly more. Who knows? Mm. Matthew's at college, but he's uh, at home at the minute and he's just doing everything online. And then unfortunately, my son who works in a restaurant, he just got laid off yesterday. Uh, But you know what? Things could be a lot worse. We've just got to knuckle down and uh, stay healthy. And hopefully this virus hopefully will be gone in two or three weeks and hopefully the nation can get back to normal. Yes. Oh, well, I hope so, too. Oh, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. We will link up all the information about the book. We'll see how I can go about posting a recipe or two. And uh, I'm just wishing you and your boys all the best. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you for having me on the show. And you and your family stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, hopefully we'll catch up with another diabetic conference. Yeah, hopefully down the road when everything is rescheduled. It's, exactly. You know, the best thing is going to be it's going to be a very busy fall, I think. I think so, too. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Lots more information at the episode homepage. And of course, as I mentioned, we'll put some of the recipes and other information. Mark was very generous in giving me an excerpt from the book. I will put that in the Facebook group, Diabetes Connections, the group. I don't care what he says. I am not trying a kale smoothie. I've been there, done that. But for somebody like me, having a green smoothie is a big step. I do eat a lot of vegetables, but I never thought I'd like a smoothie. But like I said, the spinach smoothie was great. So, hey, just like he said, one new thing, one new thing. Try it. See if you like it. You know, I'm trying to teach my kids, although my husband is a really good cook and he's done a much better job of teaching the kids actual cooking skills. But I try to teach them that mistakes are okay, which is coming out of my mouth. I I just realized that just sounds like everything else I say with diabetes. But I mean, it's my philosophy of cooking, too. Because I make a ton of mistakes and everything somehow tastes good. I mean, sure, I've burned things. The first book I wrote was I Can't Cook, But I Know Someone Who Can. And actually, Mark has a a recipe in that book. He has a wonderful recipe. The conceit of that book is that I can't cook. So I went and asked all of my restaurant and chef friends for recipes. And it was a big book for charity for JDRF. And it was a lot of fun. But I did write a whole bunch of kitchen disaster stories into that book. Yeah, I think my life philosophy is make all the mistakes. Hey, it's working out so far. Up next... Tell me something good. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. We have been using the Dexcom G6 since it came out almost two years ago. Is that possible? It is just amazing. The Dexcom G6 is FDA permitted for no finger sticks for calibration and diabetes treatment decisions. You do that two hour warm up and then the number just pops up. If you, like us, had used Dexcom for a long time before that, it's really wild to see the number just kind of self populate. You used to have to do a lot more finger sticks for calibration. We've been using the Dexcom for a long time. It was six years this past December, and it just keeps getting better. The G6 has longer sensor wear, 10 days, and the new sensor applicator is so much easier to use. And of course, the alerts and alarms, we can set them how we want. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes treatment decisions. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. And tell me something good this week. If you saw this post on social media, you might have thought, Stacy, your tell me something good backgrounds are usually blue. Why was this one orange? Well, that's because, my friends, it featured mac and cheese. So let me tell you about Ty Gibbs. Ty is a swimmer at Henderson State University in Arkansas. He was diagnosed in 2017. It was actually very serious. 
he was being rushed to the hospital at the time. You know, he was in intensive care. He spent time in the ICU. But his mom, Cheryl, says as he was rushed into the ICU, he was just starving. And he kept asking for mac and cheese over and over again. Every year since, we celebrate with a ton of mac and cheese. So this, tell me something good on social media, the photo, if you saw it, was his teammates and friends celebrating his diversary with seven pounds of mac and cheese and a cake. You want to talk about a carb explosion. You know, of course, this celebration took place weeks ago. I believe this happened very early in March, or maybe it was even in late February when they actually celebrated it before the social distancing was taking effect. But I really appreciate Cheryl sharing this story. I love the idea of celebrating with mac and cheese. That would be something for my daughter more so than my son. When the kids all left Tulane, they were asked to empty their dorm rooms of food. They weren't ordered to. It was a food drive for people in New Orleans. And a lot of these kids, like my daughter, most kids in Tulane are from far away. So a lot of them you know, were jumping on planes or, or getting out of there and going long distances and didn't want to pack up everything in their dorm room. So the school organized a big food drive. And I tell you all this because my daughter donated her mac and cheese. I know she had other junk in her room that she didn't share with me, but oh my gosh, she's definitely the mac and cheese lover in the family. So thanks, Ty, and congratulations on your diversary. Hopefully next year we can celebrate again. We'll send you some mac and cheese too. Our other Tell Me Something Good comes from Laura Villado, a familiar name to many of you. She is the powerhouse behind the Friends for Life conferences and so much more with children with diabetes. But recently, Laura found herself in the unusual situation of asking for help. She has connected thousands of people over the years. That's no exaggeration. The Friends for Life conference is 20 years old and the Children with Diabetes organization is older than that. And I'm telling you, they have connected so many people to each other for help, for education, for inspiration, for friendships, including me. I've made so many friends there. But her son actually needed the help. Her adult son doesn't live with them. But with everything that was going on, came back home to Michigan a couple of weeks ago. And they were having trouble with diabetes supplies. Uh, they had been, I'm not going to go through all the details, but like many of us, you know, they had insurance issues. Somebody wasn't following through. The supply wasn't coming when it was supposed to come. And so they turned to the diabetes community for help. And as we always do, people reached out. And so she posted a great picture about two weeks ago now almost that Mike Hoskins, who's also been on the show, is a great writer over at Diabetes Mine, and his wife Susie, they met for coffee, although they met, you can see in the picture, they're six feet apart each at Zingerman's Coffee Roastery, which was still open for takeout. And this picture looks great. I bet that's a terrific coffee place. I'd love to check it out if I'm ever in town there. But of course, the big deal was that Michael was able to help her with the supplies that she needed. Is your community doing that? We're having a lot of that here in the Charlotte area where people are just reaching out. I already, no surprise, gave insulin to a friend of mine who's got an adult son who does not have insurance and is really struggling right now. So we were able to donate to them. I've got friends who had, you know, oh, my Omnipod PDM knocked out and, you know, they're going to get us a new one. But does anybody have one in the meantime? Anybody spare a sensor? Little things like that go such a long way. You know, I mean, I say little things. They're, they're really not when you come to rely on this stuff day to day. Could we go without, except for the insulin? Of course, we would do finger pokes. We would use shots. But you know you don't want to be without this technology once you have it. So way to go, Mike Hoskins. Way to go, Laura Villado, because it's tough to ask for help, especially when you've always been in the position of providing it. I'm so glad everybody got what they needed. All right, tell me something good. It's the best segment of the show each week. Tell me what you got. You can send it in, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com, post it in the Facebook group, or if I see it like I did with Laura, I'll just get your permission to share your story. But I really love when you send them in. So keep them coming and tell me something good. Not too much to say here before I let you go. I do apologize for sort of the weirdness of the schedule. I always pride myself on every week, the consistency of getting the show out there on Tuesdays and then those mini episodes I was doing on Thursdays. But gosh, I feel, I bet you feel the same. It's almost like time has no meaning right now, right? What day of the week is it? Am I eating breakfast? Am I having cocktails? You know, it's, it's just a crazy time right now. So I am giving myself the grace to put out episodes when they make sense. I am listening to podcasts right now when I am listening that are entertaining and distract me. 
I'm listening to a lot of my Game of Thrones podcasts, a lot of my history podcasts, um, a lot of podcasts that make me laugh. So I'm not that concerned about getting my news up to date from podcasts. I hope an episode like this, you know, gave you 40 minutes or 50 minutes. I, I honestly don't know what it's going to come out to yet of distraction, entertainment, something good to think about and a feeling that you're not alone. As we go forward in these weeks, I, I'm not sure, just like everything else, I'm not sure what the podcast production schedule is going to look like. Of course, I have my sponsors and I will do what is responsible and we'll get those episodes out. But I really liked connecting on Zoom calls, Facebook Live, other things like that. So as with everything else after this is over, we'll see what the podcast landscape looks like, right? I mean, who knows? Uh, I, I hope to keep doing this, but we shall see. We'll see where you all are. It's going to be a long, long time before things go back to quote normal. And I don't know what that's going to look like. I do hope and expect that we will be in it together as we have been, as the diabetes community always is. So please let me hear from you. Tell me what's on your mind. And I really appreciate you tuning in as always. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan of Audio Editing Solutions. John, I hope you're staying safe in Philadelphia and doing well and that your kids are all right as well. And thank you as always for listening. Stay safe. I'll see you soon. And more now than ever before, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>